A fluid is sandwiched between two flat plates that are a distance h apart. The bottom plate is stationary and the top plate moves at velocity v in the positive x direction. There is a positive pressure gradient dp dx in the positive x direction. What is the lowest value of dp dx at which some of the fluid will reverse? Now the way to start this question is to draw a diagram. So we have two plates. This is the top plate and it's moving at speed v in the positive x direction. This is the bottom plate and it's stationary. Now I'm going to start with a physical argument. I'm going to draw an axis through this plate um, and this isn't a simple xy plot. On the horizontal axis I'm going to draw vx, that's the velocity in the x direction, and the vertical axis is just going to be y, as before, as you'd expect. Um, and so this is going to be the velocity profile in the fluid. Now we know that, because of the no-slip condition, at the top of the fluid, uh, where the fluid hits the wall, that must be going at velocity big V. So I'm going to draw big V in there, that's the value at the top. At the bottom of the fluid, the velocity must be equal to zero. So that's that value down there. And in the between the two, we must have um, a parabola. Now, when there's no pressure gradient, then we're going to get a straight line between the two, which is really just a special parabola. We're told there's a positive pressure gradient. That means that the pressure downstream is higher than the pressure upstream. Uh, the fluid streamwise direction is in the same direction as the top plate, obviously. Um, so that means we'll have a parabola that's pointing, if you like, away from the high towards the low. So as we increase the pressure gradient, the fluid velocity profile will look something like this, and this shape I'm tracing out is a parabola. So now as we increase, increase the pressure further, we'll get another parabola. We'll go through and back to zero at the bottom, and then at very high pressure gradients we'll get this sort of shape. Again, a parabola. And I'm just going to draw in the velocity vectors for this last case. Uh, I'll do them in green. This is what the velocity profile would look like. And you'll see in this case we have negative velocity. That's reverse flow and that's arisen because the pressure gradient from high to low has beaten, if you like, this dragging the fluid forwards with the top plate. Let's zoom in on this region at the bottom plate and draw the velocity profile when it's just about to reverse. When it's just about to reverse, the velocity profile will be a parabola and at that point there, dvx by dy will equal zero. Uh, if it's negative, it'll be going on that side and there'll be reverse flow somewhere. Uh, if it's positive, it'll be on that side and there'll be no reverse flow. So this line in the middle is where it's equal to zero and that's the point at which we'll just get a little bit of fluid just here reversing. So the problem's really asking uh, at what relationship between dp dx h and big V will dvx by dy at y equals zero, i.e. at the bottom wall, be equal to zero? Now we've seen already that a force balance on an element of fluid, if we assume constant viscosity, um, can be written like this, mu d2 vx by dy squared is equal to dp by dx. Now I've left those in as partial derivatives for the moment, but of course because vx only depends on y, and because p, the pressure field, only depends on x, this can be written as an ordinary differential equation, mu d2 vx by dy squared is equal to dp dx. And now we want to derive an expression for vx, the velocity profile, 
in terms of dpdx and in terms of the things like, let's scroll back up, the distance between the plates, which is h, and in terms of big V. Now to do this you can either use definite integrals where you put the limits at the top and bottom of the integral sign or you can use indefinite integrals. Uh, either's fine. I'm going to use indefinite integrals here. Uh, so the next line in this will be the integral of d of dvx dy is equal to 1 upon mu, which I've moved to the other side, dp by dx. And now we've got a dy on this side and we'll put an integral sign around it. Now I've pulled the 1 upon mu dp dx uh, on the other side of the integral sign simply because they're not functions of y, so that's OK. And then when we in integrate this, it's very simple. On this side we get dvx by dy, and on this side we get 1 upon mu dp dx as before, and then just a y, but we mustn't forget to add a constant, um, which is our constant of integration. Now then we do this step again, I won't be quite so explicit now, we'll just get vx is equal to 1 upon mu dp by dx y squared upon 2 plus a y plus another constant of integration that I shall call b. Now the first boundary condition is that at y equal to 0, vx is equal to 0, the no slip boundary condition at the bottom wall, and that by inspection you can see setting y to 0 here, y to 0 here, and vx to 0 implies that b is equal to 0. The next boundary condition is that at y equal to big H, vx is equal to big V, and this is going to take a bit of algebraic manipulation now, which I'll do on the next page. Um, so substituting in, we're going to get big V is equal to 1 upon mu dp by dx of times, sorry, h squared over 2 plus a h plus b, but we know that b is equal to 0. Now we need to solve for a, so we'll take this term in the middle over to the left-hand side. We'll get big V minus 1 upon mu dp by dx times h squared over 2 is equal to a h, but leave it as a and take the h onto the other side. And there we've got an expression for a. Now we substitute this value of a into the expression for v that we have up here. Um, it starts off a little bit ugly, but then simplifies greatly. Uh, so we get vx is equal to 1 upon mu dp by dx y squared upon 2 plus, now substituting in for a, we're going to get a vy over h minus a 1 upon mu dp by dx h squared over h, which is h, divided by 2 multiplied by y. And then gathering together the terms in 1 upon mu, we're going to get vx is equal to 1 upon mu dp by dx multiplied by y squared minus hy upon 2 plus vy upon h. Now we should ask ourselves, we should always ask ourselves, does this look realistic? Um, let's do a little test. If v that's big V, is equal to 0, uh, we should get um, Poisson flow, just a parabola. Um, so if big V is equal to 0, then the second term in the equation is equal to 0, and what we have, sure enough, is a parabola. And let's just check that y equals to 0, V of x is equal to 0, that's right, and at y is equal to big H at the top plate, Vx is equal to 0. So that all works out. Uh, and then we know that if dp by dx is equal to 0, we should have just Couette flow. In other words, it should be a linear velocity profile um, with big V at the top and 0 at the bottom plate. And we can see by inspection that that is indeed the case. So everything looks OK. And in fact, we can see that we have these two, these two terms. This is the linear profile. If you like, that's the one that comes from Couette flow. 
And this here is the parabolic profile, which comes from Poisson flow. So we've got combined Couette Poisson flow, and we can see the two terms appearing in the expression for Vx here as a function of y. Now let's scroll back up a couple of pages and remember what the question was asking us. We're essentially being asked to find the relationship between dp dx v and h, which gives dv dx dy at y is equal to zero uh, equal to zero. We have an expression for vx as a function of y. We want now dvx by dy at y equal to zero. So dvx by dy, I'll write down now, is 1 upon mu dp by dx. I'm differentiating this term up here now. We're going to get 2y minus h upon 2, and then plus v over h. Now we're looking at the case when y is equal to 0. So this term here goes to 0. And what we get, and that's all equal to 0 uh, at the case that we're looking at, we get simply that, uh, excuse me, implies um, that taking the v over h to the other side will give us a minus, but it cancels with that minus there. We're going to get that h upon 2 is equal to mu v over h, and then with the dp dx on this side. So that implies that dp dx is equal to 2 mu v over h squared when the first bit of fluid reverses, so when the first flow reversal occurs. Now let's just again check to make sure that this makes sense. What we're saying essentially is that we need to get an adverse pressure gradient, a positive dp dx, in order to get flow reversal. Um, now v is always positive, h is always positive, mu is always positive, so that's working in terms of the signs. We see furthermore that as mu increases, as the viscosity increases, we need to have a higher adverse pressure gradient in order to get flow reversal. Does that make sense? Well, yes it does, because what we have here is a competition between, let me do a little sketch, we have a competition between this plate pulling across to the right and momentum diffusing down from the top plate, we have that competing with an adverse pressure gradient, dp by dx, acting to push the fluid back that way. When the pressure gradient wins, when this one wins, the flow starts to reverse. But when we diffuse faster, in other words, when the viscosity increases, then this plate tends to win. So there's a competition between the two, and this becomes, um, this is a very useful concept for when we look at boundary layers later on.